150 psalms carefully arranged to depict the up and down story of the Davidic kingdom. It was established through conflict and elevated to glory in books one and two. And then this idyllic picture was crushed and trampled on in books three, where we ask, how long, O Lord, have you rejected and abandoned the covenant with David? Book four calls us to remember two things. One, God reigns as king, whether there is a Davidic seed on the throne or not. And two, God is a forgiving God, and that has not changed. All that remains here in book five is to explicitly state that the exiles will be restored to the land, and a son of David will be restored to the throne. And that is exactly what book five does. And it tells us how to respond to that restoration as well with unqualified and unhindered praise. Now, the structure of book five is amazing. Um, it is another chiasm where the outer frame has a couple of sets of Davidic psalms followed by an acrostic, an alphabet poem, and then the inner frame has two liturgical sets. In 113 to 118 is the great Hallel, and then in 120 to 134 are the songs of ascent, and then, of course, at the center of that chiasm is a poem about the Torah, just like at the center of the chiasms here in Book 1. Now, the first psalm in Book 5 kind of stands outside of this pattern, this structure a little bit. Psalm 107 was placed here at the very beginning of Book 5 to respond to the very end of Book 4. Take a look at this. End of book four, what did we have? We had the cry of the exiles, didn't we? Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations. And what do we have at the beginning of book five? Um, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he's redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands. Gather us from the nations, he has. He's gathered us from the lands. All right, so we're back from the exile. This is wonderful. But what about David? Well, the museum curator has responded to that by giving us a little triad. He's given us a triad of Davidic Psalms here in 108 to 110. And what's curious about Psalm 108 is that it copies eight lines verbatim, word for word, from uh, Psalm 60. Take a look at this a little copycat action going on here. <clears throat> so, on this side, we need to have Psalm 108. And then we have Psalm 60 on this side, make it a little bit smaller just so we can see kind of the whole thing here. Look at this, from five all the way down to 12, and then from six all the way down to 13. Do these not look to you to be word for word the same? So what has he changed? Um, what adaptations has he made to this original Psalm 60? Well, look how Psalm 60 begins um, and how it's a little bit different in Psalm 108. You have rejected us. You've broken down our defenses. Oh, you've been angry. Please restore us. This is clearly a lament, isn't it? Psalm 60. But look at Psalm 108. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. I will give thanks to the Lord among the peoples. The psalmist, or the editor, the museum curator, David himself, he has transformed a lament into a praise. Isn't that amazing? This is signaling a change and a transformation in the fate of the Davidic dynasty. And then in Psalm 109, we have the longest imprecatory psalm in the whole Psalter, where David calls on God to crush those who are crushing him. Now I ask you, has the Davidic monarchy been crushed? You bet it has. But how will God respond to the enemies of the son of David? Well, we're told in Psalm 110, right after that imprecatory Psalm 109. Take a look at Psalm 110. I'm sure you know this Psalm pretty well. <clears throat> it's uh, actually quoted more than any other single place in the entire Old Testament, in the New Testament. Um, it states two words from God the Father, from Yahweh to the, the Messianic King. First one um, is in 
verse 1. Second one is in verse 4. The Lord said to my Lord, um, God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's going to happen pretty soon. Your enemies who have crushed the Davidic kingdom, they're going to be made your footstool. When? On the day of your power, on the day of his wrath. And what's What's he to do in the meantime as he he waits at the right hand of God? Well, he has a role. He's got a pretty important job. He's got to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what does this all mean? The promise to David is back on. And how do we respond to that? With praise, of course, starting in Psalm 111 all the way down to 117. We get seven psalms which all either begin or end with the inclusio, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And that collection in 113 to 118 is called the Great Hallel. It is sung every year at Passover among the Jews. And you bet that Jesus sang those same group of psalms as well. Take a look at um, the Last Supper in the account in the book of, uh, in, in the Gospels in Matthew uh, to take a look at that. But why? <laughs> I ask you, do we have this reference to the Passover here at this place in uh, book five? Um, Well, they are placed here in book five in order to anticipate a new exodus, the time when um, the scattered exiles, the people of God, will return to Zion and a messianic king will rule from um, Jerusalem over the nations. And that leads us to kind of another little break in the pattern here in 118. It does not begin and end with hallelujah, but rather with the inclusio, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. You see Psalm 118, well, that's a messianic psalm. It's a messianic psalm of victory um, where the Messiah enters into Jerusalem. (laughs) Take a look at this. It's so much like uh, Psalm 24 in that way. Open up, O gates, that the king of glory may come in. We remember that from Psalm 24, but now let's look at Psalm 118, and especially at verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them. And at Jesus' triumphal entry, uh, (coughs) the people there outside of Jerusalem, they recognized that Psalm 118 is a psalm about the Messiah. And therefore, what did they say? Um, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, we pray. Save us, O Lord. Give us success. And blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Words quoted about Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem. So here we have a messianic Psalm 118. And then right next to it, a Torah psalm. And we've seen that pattern before, where a Messiah psalm is placed right next to a Torah psalm. A Torah psalm is surrounded by Messiah psalms. You'll get this quite frequently in the Psalter. <clears throat> and this Torah psalm, well, it is a doozy. Um, 176 verses, 22 stanzas following the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, eight verses each um, following the letters, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. Vav, Zion, hate, take Yod, cough, all the way to Tav. It is a fantastic work of literary art, praising the blessedness of God's instruction for man. Following this is our second set of liturgical psalms. These are the songs of ascent, literally the songs of going up. Now, most people conceive of these psalms as being written or composed for the pilgrims, You know how Israel had to go up to Jerusalem three times a year for the annual um, uh, pilgrimage festivals? Well, I present to you the possibility that maybe these psalms, uh, the primary referent, are not pilgrims, but rather the Messiah himself. Let's see, try to get my bearings here. Um, Rather, the Messiah, who Psalm 118 just told us, goes up to Jerusalem and then in Psalm 118 teaches from the Torah in the temple? I mean, does this sound like Isaiah chapter 2 to you? Or even um, the last week of Jesus' life when he entered in Jerusalem and then he taught the people from the temple? Um, That's kind of uh, compelling, especially when you consider the internal structure of the Songs of Ascent. 
three sets of five, 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 five. And at the center um, of each of these five songs of ascent, there is a Zion song, or, or that is a song with Zion theology, 122, 127, 132. And Zion theology, of course, focuses on the Messiah ruling over the nations from Jerusalem. The high point of these Zion Psalms within the Songs of Ascent is, of course, Psalm 132. It is amazing. Let's take a look at that Psalm together. Psalm 132. <coughs> we want to do it kind of side by side with uh, my little breakdown of that Psalm here. Make that a little bit smaller. So <coughs> we have two cycles here. We got a first cycle in 1 to 10 and another cycle in 11 through 18. And um, in the first cycle, David is going to swear to Yahweh, I will build you um, a temple. I will find a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. I'm going to build you a temple. And of course, what did God say? How did you respond to David's um, noble promise to build a temple for God? Yahweh swore um, <coughs> an, an oath to David. It was a sure oath um, from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my um, covenant, their sons also forever will sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion, desired it to be his dwelling place. It is my resting place forever. And David will rule from that city. Well, Psalm 132 stands as if upon a mountaintop, affirming the validity of God's promise to David, excuse me, God's promise to David, despite the doubts of Psalm um, 89. Now, very appropriately, our museum curator here is going to give the last word in the book of Psalms to David, <coughs> the sweet psalmist of Israel. And this 138 to 144 are a sampling of Davidic laments and trust psalms and praises, all of which are confident that God will deliver his Messiah. And this final acrostic in 145, um, just like Psalms 93 to 99, are going to merge the role of God and king together. I mean, does that sound like Jesus to you? Um, into the same uh, person. Let's, let's take a look at 145 verse 1. All right, let's not get distracted with all these open windows. 145. <clears throat> I extol you, my God and King. I bless your name forever and forever. Every day I bless you. And then this line, um, verse 13, looks like it could have been pulled right from the book of Daniel. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations, the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all of his works. Well, as we observed earlier, just as there is a two-psalm introduction to the whole Psalter, there is a five-psalm conclusion. And each one of those is going to have an inclusio. It's going to start, the first verse is going to be, praise Yahweh, hallelujah, and so will the last verse. But the middle psalm, Psalm 148, it's going to have a double praise the Lord, just like the first one, 146, and the last one, 145. There's something special about that middle psalm of the conclusion of the whole book of uh, Psalms. Let's look at that very special Psalm 148. 148. What's going on with this wonderful <coughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord? Psalms. It's going to praise the Lord from the heavens, praise the Lord from the earth, and for two reasons. He is the creator of all that is, and the Lord has raised up a horn for his people. Raised up a horn? What's he talking about there? Well, a horn, um, you might recall, is a common metaphor for a king. God raised up a king for his people. Now, Zechariah. You remember who that guy is? There's a couple of them. Um, I'm talking about Zechariah, John the Baptist's daddy. And after nine months of being mute, he is going to break the silence with these words. Zechariah's prophecy, <coughs> filled with the Holy Spirit, 
he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn for sal of salvation for us in the house of David. So here we are at the very center of the conclusion of the Psalter, praises Yahweh for a future messianic king who will rule over all nations, launching us back to the um, beginning of the Psalter, God's plan to rescue, to restore, and to reign over the world through a son of David.